Welcome to Bible Study. My name is Sam Nobles. I'm the teaching pastor here at Northside Baptist Church, and today we are in session 13 of the spring semester of LifeWays Explore the Bible. Today we're looking at another post-resurrection appearance of Jesus, this time to his disciples. Uh, this story will pick up uh, after some of the women had visited the tomb. They had found it empty, and they reported uh, this, the angelic uh, pronouncement that Jesus is alive. But the disciples, they had their doubts about it. Peter and John, they went to the tomb to see for their self. And sure enough, it was empty. The other disciples even questioned their testimonies. But Jesus would appear later to Mary Magdalene and Peter, and then they would share those experiences back with the group, of, uh, with the group again, but they still had their doubts. Some were open to this news, but they just wondered what it meant. Just before Jesus appeared to this larger group of followers, we had the disciples on the way to Emmaus. They had an encounter with Jesus as well. And they are sharing their experience that they had with the other disciples. And when they come and, and they share this experience, it is behind locked doors because they were scared for their life. And it was during this time when the, when the men from Emmaus were sharing with the disciples behind locked doors that Jesus appears to them all. And that story picks up in Luke chapter 24, verse 36. As they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst. He said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. Why are you troubled, he asked them, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you can see I have. Having said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they still were amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. So Jesus appears to these followers, and he assures them and addresses all of their doubts. He says, I'm, I'm alive. I'm not a ghost. He says, you can touch me. He says, look at my wounds. It's really me. I have the holes in my hands and my feet and my side. It's really me. You can touch me, handle me, see that I have flesh and bone. He says, I'm not a ghost. I'm really here with you. This is a real deal. In fact, give me something to eat so I can prove that I'm really here with you. And so they give him a piece of fish and he eats it. You know, as I read this, and he's showing them the scars in his hands and his feet and the, and the wound in his side, it reminds me that the only thing in heaven that will be man-made are those scars. You see, Jesus shows his scars to identify himself as the risen Savior, no doubt. He shows his scars to identify the depth of his love, what he is willing to do for those he created. But Jesus also identifies with us because just like with these guys, life is painful. Life can have hurts. Life can be difficult. And so often we find ourselves tempted to think that, that we can't we can't take it. We can't stand it. We can't be under this any longer. And it's at those moments where Jesus would show us his hands and his feet and his side and let us know that I've done this for you. I identify with you. I know what pain and hurt is like. I've been there. You're going to make it through, not because of your own strength, but because of my strength for you. You see, you have pain and you have pressure 
And, and when you think you can't take any more, that's when we look at the hands and feet of Jesus and realize what he's done for us and how he identifies with us. In fact, the writer of the book of Hebrews would tell us that we do not have a high priest that is not acquainted with grief and sorrow and pain like we are. You see, the whole point of Jesus putting on flesh was to reverse the curse of sin that came upon man. And for that to be done, then God would have to become man. You see, we had Adam who sinned and brought sin into the world. So a second Adam, as Paul the Apostle would call Jesus in Romans chapter 5, the second Adam came to make everything right. Where the first Adam sinned at a tree, the second Adam gave his life on a tree. Where the first Adam ate fruit in obedience to Satan, the second Adam would give his life to bear much fruit in obedience to God. Where Adam's sin would cause thorns to grow from the ground, the second Adam, Jesus, would wear upon his head a crown of thorns as he gave his life for me and you. Everything that sin brought into the earth, Jesus would reverse at his death, and he did so as a man, fully God, fully man. And that is what makes God in the flesh. This is what makes Jesus so incredibly unique, is that he never put down his divinity, but he acquired flesh to put on. And he lived a human life, fully God, fully man, knows the pains, knows the trouble, knows the pressures that you face. And as he walks through it, we can look at what he's done for us and know that he understands completely and exactly what you're going through. So when we find ourselves going through the pressures and we look to Jesus who identifies with us because of the scars on his hands and feet, we also can take the scars of life to identify with other people who are hurting and going through difficult circumstances and pressures to say, I understand because I've been there. Look at the scars that life has given me. And we're able to share the strength that we had from Jesus with these other people that are going through difficulty. It's a beautiful thing that Jesus made sure that they could touch him. He's not spirit. He is raised bodily. And now Jesus sits at the right hand of God as a man making intercession for the people that he created, for the human beings that he created mankind. And that is super special because now we have a representative. Human beings have someone in the flesh representing them at the right hand of God, interceding for them at the right hand of God. And when Jesus put on flesh, it wasn't just for 33 years. When God decided to put on flesh, it was an eternal decision. Because when we see Jesus face to face, the Bible tells us we will see him as a lamb who had been slain. He will still hold the scars from the cross. He'll still hold all of those wounds that were given to him in his hands, feet, and side. And will always be a reminder to us what he has done in the flesh, risen bodily, so that you and I could, could be in right standing with God by believing in him, repenting of our sins, connecting with his work, the finished work of the cross. Well, let's read on and see what happens here. Look at verse 44. He told him, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He also said to them, this is what is written, the Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. So Jesus opened the minds of his followers 
so that they could understand the truths about him that he had emphasized before his crucifixion, before the resurrection, that, that it would happen. Now, this is absolutely amazing to me that not only did he teach the guys on the road to Emmaus from Moses and all the things of the prophets concerning him, with this group of followers, he does the same thing, but he goes through the Psalms and he shows all the fulfillment of the prophecies. And it is staggering the amount of prophecies that just the one life of Jesus Christ fulfilled. In fact, there was a book written called Odds Are. And in this book, the, the author takes uh, the person of Jesus and there are 300 plus prophecies that he fulfilled with his birth, life, death, and resurrection. And there's 300 plus prophecies that he fulfilled. But that number is so overwhelming that he said, let's just bring it back down to say that he fulfilled eight of those 300 plus prophecies. And he took some of the most obscure eight prophecies that Jesus fulfilled with his birth, life, death, and resurrection, and he gave it a probability. He gave it odds. The odds of one man fulfilling these eight prophecies the way that Jesus did is one in 10 to the 17th power. Now, I had to look that up. And that is a one with 17 zeros behind it. So whatever you call that number, that's the odds that Jesus would fill, fulfill just eight of the 300 plus prophecies. He said it's so staggering, it would be equivalent to filling the state of Texas uh, with silver dollars, silver coins, knee high over the entire state. He says, and then you have one guy who arbitrarily a skydiver jumps out of a plane, parachutes down into the state of Texas, and where he lands, he finds a coin that's marked the, uh, of all the coins that were in the state of Texas. He said, that's how staggering the odds are that Jesus would fulfill eight of these particular obscure prophecies that he fulfilled in one life. And we look at this, and Jesus shows them all of these things. And to do so, he had to open their minds so that they could understand it. When you read your Bible, when I read my Bible, one of the things we need to make sure that we ask of God is to open our minds to understand so that we can see the person of Jesus in the scriptures when we read them. Whether it's Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, whether it's Revelation, Hosea, Habakkuk, Obadiah, any of the books that we read, we need to be looking for the person of Jesus Christ. And we need to pray for that. God, open our minds to see that, just like he did for these disciples. And it was so important that they received this confirmation that not only that they touch him, but he proved not only physically, but he proved spiritually through the word of God that it's me. I'm the one that all of this has spoken of. Well, let's see how this ends. Verse 47. He says, And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And look, I'm sending you what my father promised. As for you, stay in the city until you're empowered from on high. Now, Jesus will go on to say in later writings that he's speaking of the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father is that, that the disciples of Jesus would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. This is the absolute ability to carry out the mission of the Lord is to have the Holy Spirit, to be empowered, to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This is how we do the things God has called us to do. This is how we become what God has called us to be. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this will lead into uh, the book of Acts where he will tell them again, you're going to be my witnesses. Now, I love that phrase, witnesses. 
because that's something different. He doesn't call us to be attorneys to argue points. God calls us to be witnesses. What does a witness do? Let me tell you what I have seen, what I have heard, what I've experienced. Let me show you how this has worked out in my life. I don't have to prove anything. There's no burden of proof on me for anything. There's no argument that I need to have. I am a witness. This has happened in my life, and no one can tell me that it's wrong or that it hasn't. No matter what your testimony is, there's a time before you knew Jesus and a time where you come to know him as Savior. And no one can tell you that your life is still the same after you come to know Jesus. No one can, can have enough proof to, 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 to show that because it's not about the burden of proof. It's about the fact that I'm a witness and I've been given this power from on high, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to be this witness, the boldness to say these things. And you're going to see a, a huge change in the lives of the disciples after the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They are going to, as the book of Acts tells us, turn their world upside down. You know, as I look at, at this scripture passage that we just read today, Jesus identifies with us. He knows the pains and the pressures and, and the difficulties that we faced. But he's given us his word where he reveals himself to us. And he gives us his spirit to empower us to be able to walk through this, this life that we're in, to live a life that's pleasing to God and to be all that God has called us to be. So, I pray that, that you would get into your word, that you would ask for God to open your mind so that you can be uh, empowered by the Spirit to be the best witness that you can possibly be for Him. Let's pray. Father God, I am so thankful for you, and I'm so thankful for the promise of the Father to, to empower us from on high with the Holy Spirit to enable us to be the witnesses to live out, to speak out what you called us to be. God, uh, I just pray that we would be opened to your word, that you would open our minds, show us Jesus in the scriptures. Let us share these things, not, not to keep it to ourselves, but to tell everyone that we know, Lord, to make it known about that Jesus is Lord, that he is risen from the dead. And it is in his holy name that I pray. Amen. I am so glad that you are with me for Bible study today, and I hope you'll join me again next time.